I volunteered. I thought it was fascinating that we could use a mobile phone to impact health. And here I went full circle back into my health space. Um, and I, so I started writing for her and helped her to um, define her value proposition and, and build decks and do all the things that you do for startups. And in the process, I got introduced to the nascent Health 2.0 world. And she had won the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Games for Health Challenge. And we went down to the Health 2.0 conference. I met, you know, Unity Stokes before startup health was anything and, and, uh, and just was blown away. It was like this, like, what is happening in this space? This is amazing. So as I do, I go at it full force. And I was like, I know how to read and write. I'm going to be a journalist. And so I basically pretended it initially, and then I became a journalist. And I started writing for anybody that would publish my stuff. So this is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 98. Hi everyone, Omari Richens here. Thank you all for joining me today. Be sure to subscribe to me. Be sure to follow me on Instagram at the PH Millennial. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast if you have not already. Great, it greatly helps. Be sure to leave a five-star review as well. Leave a like if you're watching this on YouTube and share with a friend. Help the show get out to more people. And if you'd like to support outside of those other ways, you can go to the phmillennial.com forward slash support and support there. Really enjoyed today's episode. Um, this person's journey is something that I have not heard of before, but I, I just I just love how she was able to like go from anthropology into learning about um, East Asia and Japanese history to to taking that into like public health and communication realm, which I thought was very very fascinating. And the work that she currently does with this uh, startup organization is really cool as well. So be sure to tune into that. Um, great advice, great insights, and more unique of a story than I, I think I've had in a bit. But I uh, hope you all enjoy. Peace. Today, we have someone who has worked as a communications and research strategist in healthcare, design, and technology for over 10 years. Her work is grounded in multi-method research, while she is passionate about helping people and teams to more fully communicate their purpose and strategically expand their capacity to positively impact by connecting dots across different pathways forward. She got her bachelor's degree in anthropology at Columbia University, then got a master of arts in East Asian studies, Japanese interwar history. She currently works as a director of strategic communications at Bento. We have Susan E. Schaffler. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I am excited to be here, and um, I'm even more excited just to hear about your Japanese interwar history as, as your master's <laughs> degree, um, and I look, look forward to hearing how, how that all works into your, your journey and the work that you do today. Mm -hmm. I look forward to trying to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, how, how are you doing and how you've been coping during these times? Yeah, um, I think it's, uh, I'm doing well today, and I think for the most part, it's been taking it day by day. I've got two young children who each went through the, you know, homeschool and transitioning back into school and rapid COVID testing and colds. And so it's been, um, yeah, just going slowly and pacing myself. <laughs> Completely understand that, especially with, with yeah. kids in this time of like a lot of uncertainty, especially around children and not being able to get vaccinated and, and all, all those other things that come with it. And like yeah. the, home, the homeschooling part and everyone working from home and all those different dynamics that came up during the pandemic has been very, very interesting, to say the least. I'm, yeah, I'm sure the stories have been epic to write a book about it <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure that's for sure so so uh tell me how do you identify and then tell us a little a little bit about your personal background sure so um so my pronouns i identify as a she her um i have 
been, I'm recently divorced, um, which is, I guess, a good thing. Um, I've got two young kids. I've got a three and a half year old boy who is always sticky. His name is Sticky Mickey, in fact. Um, just always sticky. And then I've got a nine and a half year old girl named Lillian, and um, she wants to be a veterinarian and she's obsessed with learning about all the ick and the goo that happens and injuries and wants to like you know looks at youtube videos of surgical procedures and she's an interesting child um but we live in los angeles um we've got a pandemic puppy who may or may not interrupt us his name is emil haynes and he's an irish setter um and what else can i tell you uh yeah, I've had, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a kid who grew up um, with a single mom. Um, I grew up on, and we'll get into this when I talk about bento, but I grew up on food stamps and in the welfare system um, and was kind of first in line to ever get a master's and really treat academics in a way that um, was meant to achieve bigger and better things. So yeah, I, I guess that's, we could we could dive into all of the details later. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank <clears> you for sharing that. Um, where where did you where did you grow up? I was raised by a single mom, um, and we were all in the Hare Krishnas actually until I was about six years old, which meant that we moved around a lot when I was a kid. We moved from everything from everywhere from Calgary, Canada, to uh, temples in Brooklyn to temples in Seattle. And I was born in Seattle actually. And then my father's parents lived down in New York. And so I spent a lot of my time in New York in Westchester, about uh, half an hour north of the city. And uh, yeah, and so that's that's my, that's my childhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, thank, thank you for sure. That. That, that's uh, definitely not something that you hear every day, that, that's for sure. Oh. No, it's not. But it it does, uh, and like I said, I'll connect all the things. But it does that being born into a cult where people's identities are absorbed into the totality of the community in a very unhealthy way um, has really informed how I look at community building and and individual health today. And so I think that you know. I think everybody's past informs their present, but that really has informed a lot of the ways that I do my work. Okay, yeah, 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 and, and I could only imagine. So before we get into your very interesting collegiate career and then going into the work field, <laughs> uh, what, what does public health mean to you? Oh gosh, I, I actually really thought about this because I, I, I didn't consider the work, I haven't considered the work that I do so much public health, but um, I suppose it has been. So in my mind, public health is really about how to build healthy individual bodies, um, collective bodies in terms of nuclear family entities, and then also communities, and how the communities can feed back into the individual and into the family's health, and then and vice versa. I think public health has a duty and an interesting responsibility in educating and communicating kind of best practices and policies, but then also really um, has to be deeply listening to the people in which are residing in these communities and, and listening to the problems or to the wisdom that they have so that they can really be part of that co-design and really part of that collaboration that will meet their needs in terms of health and well-being. Absolutely. And for someone who said that they not, don't really see themselves in public health, you, uh, you described that very, very well. And, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad to, to hear your insights and your perspectives on that. Sure. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you got your Bachelor's of Arts in Anthropology at Columbia University. So what was your thought process uh, going into undergrad there? I don't know if there was any thought process, um, but I, I did start anthropology as a secondary choice. I originally went to Columbia and I only, I did an uh, early decision application at Columbia and I wanted to go into New York City and I wanted to study pre-med. I was a pre-med student for my first two years and Columbia um, has a core curriculum, which is essentially 
teaches you the history of Western science, the history of um, Western philosophy. And really what it does is helps you to understand logic and rationality and, and, and help you to question things around you. I think with pre-medicine, I was um, frustrated with what I eventually saw as the profession. Um, and I didn't think that I was going to have an opportunity to what I, do what I wanted to do, which was to help people live healthy lives and to teach them. I mean, I was like such a bio nerd. I loved biology and I would like get super excited about telling people about, you know, mitosis and meiosis and like all the, just like, look at what the body can do. And I think that I wanted to be able to teach other people or teach people that I was helping to understand that about their bodies. So I really wanted to teach. And I fell into an anthropology class accidentally. And suddenly I was seeing how I could, the aperture for questioning opened up for me. So all of a sudden I saw the idea of self and other and this um, methodology that really, um, that has a history and, uh, you know, a, a, an interesting, challenging history in a lot of ways, but like, but has a history of really trying to understand what kind of questions are the right questions to ask to get at the right information and to be able to represent something in a way that is meaningful. And anyway, so I became hooked. I fell in love with it and I shifted my major. Okay, that, that was awesome. And yeah, I've, I've had a couple of other people that have had their bachelor's in anthropology. And it's, it's so interesting to see like how that really ties into public health. I think it's like a, a base for people to understand or like just get into that mindset of, of understanding the cultures and, and how that really affects like your health and, and different things like that. So, so that, that, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, were there any other takeaways that you had uh, during your undergrad time? Yeah, so when I, I fell into anthropology and it was during a time in anthropology where we were having a major identity crisis. So, and what I mean by that is anthropologists at that time were really struggling with this idea of how to represent another culture as an anthropologist, as an other, and, and, and be able to, but then also be able to center those observations on the voices in which they were interacting with and really trying to bring, you know, to learn from. And, um, and so we got stuck in this kind of academic vernacular, like this not, um, and, you know, kind of had this like existential crisis. Um, and so, and I found it fascinating. I found the challenge of, the challenge of doing, of writing about the world and observing um, just that, that process alone, I think. Um, and I think this is why it speaks to public health is the process alone of observing is stacked with all of this other crap, like um, the science of observation and our, you know, these kind of um, tacit judgments that we have on good, bad colors, um, um, you know, even the idea of crisis and non-crisis or healthy versus non-healthy. Um, so it, it really brought up some interesting, um, I guess just interesting, interesting questions. Like I said, it opened the aperture of questioning that was really at my disposal to understand the world around me and really inspired me to eventually want to follow the line of academia to be a professor so that I could teach people how to question, not necessarily how to think about a certain culture or a, a certain timeline or anything like nothing about my expertise mattered in my mind. It was more about like, let me show you this amazing method that like shows you all these amazing opportunities around you um, and these ways of thinking about things that that I think are really just critical in today's world. So yeah, highly yeah. recommend anthropology. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and, I, and I think that that point of you making like the question is so important is, is something that is, is not under, it's not understated um, because in public health, especially people who are like going through like a dissertation and thing like that, like the question that you ask is so important to if you're actually going to be able to defend your dissertation and, and really do that. And 
then and, I, and how we frame those questions really allows us to get the types of answers or allows us not to get the type of answers that we were looking for or that that would just inform us about things in, in ways that we didn't know before uh, so that that's an important like insight just to put out there uh, so I appreciate yep. you sharing that one of course so you got your master's of arts uh, arts east asian studies and japan into war history at nyu mm -hmm. but yes Bef there was some time on your LinkedIn that I that I that I saw that there was some space in between your bachelor's yeah. and your master's. So, was there anything of consequence that you wanted to share between, like, during that time? I moved to Japan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like I said, I wanted to go into academia. I wanted to be a professor. I knew that fully when I left um, undergrad. And I knew I wanted to be an anthropology professor. And I also knew that an anthropologist studies uh, a region and you know, really w needs to identify a place where they want to do their field research. And I had read a book in one of my ethnography classes at Columbia um, on the urban space of Tokyo, which was really interesting, just the way it was, it was about kind of the the walkability of this city and how the, the city was designed in 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 some ways to showcase walking and to and to kind of build these these micro communities within it. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, it stuck in my brain. I needed to leave the country. I I literally did a here's a, a globe and I spun it and I just plopped a whole bunch of fingers on the on the globe and I applied for a whole bunch of um, English positions and for just opportunities to work abroad um, and explore. And I got called by back from Japan first. And I said, okay. And I remember being on the plane and being like, I, I mean, I couldn't even say thank you. I couldn't say hello. I, I had no idea what I was doing, but I just dropped everything and, and moved there. And then I stayed there for two years. That was that was amazing, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you you mentioned that. <laughs> that, that uh, was was there any specific like website that that you were using to like look for opportunities, or was it just like Indeed or? No, it was it was you know literally like English English teaching opportunities in Japan, Korea, China, and yeah, it was just like the loopholes to get into Japan were far less, and and it it worked out. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So what was that experience like being there for oh. two years? Well, I mean, there, I, I felt like there were, there were two ways that I knew I could experience Japan. And there was, I was going to be an English teacher, which isn't very unique. So I could either stay with the rest of the English teachers and never speak Japanese and have an experience like that and be in this foreign country, but essentially be in a Western place because I'm around all those folks. Or I could... Um, <laughs> Or I could find a Japanese friend and find Japanese people and learn the language, um, not just the spoken. I was I, when I do something, I do it very thoroughly. So I needed to learn the written language. I needed to be able to read it. I needed to be able to speak it, and I wanted to be grammatically correct on all the things. So I did all of that. I did the that the latter. So I um, ended up. And <laughs> so I ended up going to the the, uh, the red light district in Tokyo, um, where into the gay area. And I ended up meeting my, my ex-girlfriend at the time. And we, um, she spoke no English. Turns out that's really helpful. I spoke no Japanese. <laughs> and so our dates consisted of a lot of, you know, electronic dictionary and, um, you know, flip dictionaries and writing things down and picture drawing. Um, amazing the different ways you can communicate when you're really trying to express yourself <laughs> and then <laughs> and then um, but I also went um, to cafes and I would sit with my Japanese alphabet book and I would write over and over and over all the different kanji and the hiragana and the katakana and, and I learned it over time um, and then by the end of two years I could speak pretty fluently I sounded like a teenage boy and I ended up uh, applying to graduate school 
for formal studies. I decided that I really wanted to focus on Japan, ultimately thinking that I would live there part time. Um, and yeah, so I went to NYU to formalize that study. Okay, that, that is awesome. And like, I love that you said that like there are two ways to approach this, uh, being like a little US or like English bubble or like yep. really expose yourself to Japan and go on dates where you're using dictionaries to really yeah. communicate. <laughs> but, but to that point, you probably made some deep connections and, and learned a lot, not, about, not only about the language, but about the culture and the people, which, which is probably something that I'm guessing as an anthropology uh, major coming out from university or something that really excited you. Yeah, and, and, and I think there's something to be said about this, this idea of, I didn't know what to be scared of. So I, I, I didn't know what to say no to. I just said yes to all the things that I knew I wanted a kind of experience, but it turns out if you say yes to things, you open your, so like even going to, I spoke no Japanese, I go to this red light district that where gay in, in Japan at that time and even still is, is, is not fully accepted. <clears throat> and so I walked into this bar, I was the only white girl there. I, could, I was the only one who spoke English figured out how to get a beer in front of me. And um, and then it became part, my ex was part of a, a troupe of women who performed and they, um, as like cross-dressers and it's, it's kind of like a bit like the Takura Zuka of, of early days and which is um, cross-dressing women acting as men on stage. And, and, uh, and what was cool was that I got this experience, not only was I like embedded into the Japanese um, experience, but then I also got this unique alternative Japanese experience that, um, so I, I met the rest of her community and the troops and and um, and really just, yeah, like I, I think that the experience was, I would never have gotten that experience had I not been curious, had I not said yes, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> no, no no doubts about that no doubts about it but shout out to you for taking those steps and like yeah. not being scared to do that <laughs> and really uh, really like ingrain yourself into the, the community and the experience there so while you were there did you apply for your, your uh, master's or did you come back to the U.S. and then apply for your master's exactly so I came back to the U.S. met with some folks at NYU um, applied got all that stuff done, that GREs and all that stuff. Um, and then uh, went back to Japan and, and then got my acceptance letter, had some like, do I go, do I stay, do I go? And then ultimately I ended up going. Okay, okay, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, what was the thought process behind the East Asian studies and Japan into war history? Yeah, so the East Asian Studies Department at NYU is uh, really comprised of obviously like the three three Asian countries. It's the, it's it's uh, Japan, it's Korea, and China, and they all work together. I went in knowing I was going to focus on Japan, and in the, in the East Asian um, Studies Department at NYU, we had professors who were really focused on kind of what what was this how the countries were interacting with Western history, philosophy, um, democracy, political structures. And so how they, how the thought, the thought leaders and the philosophers in China or in Korea or in Japan were really wrangling with their own identity, you know, in terms of power and, and, and kind of, I guess global power. So what intrigued me about Japan was that the, the country was rapidly modernizing. So it was super isolated. And then all of a sudden it was coming into contact with what the Western powers and being influenced with culture and fashion and ideas, um, philosophies and, and political structures. And, and then the nation is also trying to maintain kind of its sovereignty over you know, what it means to be Japanese. Um, and so there was this kind of this rise of nationalism and modernity and influence of Western culture. Um, it all smashed together <laughs> in a really interesting way so that, you know, 
after World War One, you have this really interesting conflation where fascism started kind of rose up. And with fascism, there's a control of thought, there's a control of individuality. Um, what I was really interested in was the control of women and the, the control of women's bodies and the representation of that as a, a tool to almost validate some of the activities that Japan was engaging in in World War II. Okay, okay. That very, very fascinating. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you're able to, to find that type of program and, and really learn about that, which which I, I do think is a very interesting thing. Because when, when you do think of a lot of Asian countries, they have like a lot of cultural tradition that goes into that. And as you said, like the modernization of the world and how that affects the cultural aspects of it. If we look at like... Yep outside of Asia, well, I guess the Middle East is still considered Asia. If you look at Dubai or like where I, I lived in it for a bit, Oman, how yeah. how they're modernized and, and the difference between like the modernization of Oman compared to the modernization of Dubai and how that affects like their culture and people. Very, very interesting stuff in itself. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. So, so <laughs> were, were there any, uh, any like big takeaways that you had during, during your master's program? Mm. To be honest, I think the biggest takeaway, um, the biggest takeaway during my master's program was really, really understanding that the professors and the administration and the program itself that I was part of works for me. And that if I wasn't supported or getting the value that I needed to get out of that program in order to be able to accomplish my academic goals, then the it was my responsibility, but then also my right to be able to, to go to the powers that be and really communicate that to really make sure that um, the professors and, and the deans were seeing me as I was a paying customer and I was paying for a service, which was um, expensive <laughs> i think that that's important just advocating for yourself because as you said like you are paid for the school and they yeah. should they should be giving you a certain quality of service um yeah. and and if they aren't you should be you should and demand more of them or, or like get the support and and knowing i think going into a master's program especially like knowing that you are going to have that support is is very important for like your success throughout the master's program and going forward afterwards yep i think it is and and i think it was during that time i was in that was 2000 oh i i guess i i finished it in 2007 so it was before the big economic crash but mm -hmm. there was i think still a hesitancy at least in the liberal arts, to really speak about the reality that was academia in terms of professional opportunities, um, and and in the East Asian Studies Department, there was you know always a, a battle for funding, always a lack of um, positions available in in and across the country. So um, you know while learning is great it's not an end to it that's not the only thing we're trying to do we're trying to create occupations and and legacies if you will um but i think that uh sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle of everything so yeah absolutely agree with that and i think it's important to to know that like school is not the end it's like the means to get into the end that, that you want yeah 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 Okay, so after you, I, I'm, I think this is after you graduated, you were a community mm -hmm. relations associate at Little Bit Therapeutic Writing Center. So who, so tell me about how, how do you get involved in that? Or, or actually tell me, what was your thought process like work-wise afterwards? What, what, were you, what were you thinking you would do? So there was a small blip in, in between there that I didn't put into my LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. um, so I finished my... my uh, my master's program, and I went directly into a PhD program. And the PhD program was at the um, New School for Social Research, and I was looking in anthropology um, or in the anthropology um, department. And the like, I was about a, 
semester in and was coming off of kind of a rocky, um, a bit of a, I don't know exactly what's happening. Um, it was a bit, it was coming out of a, a rocky end to the, my NYU experience. And I think, I think I, I remember this happening. I was in a class and it was a whole bunch of amazing brains all sitting in this classroom talking about anthropology and cultural studies. And we're talking about Marxist theory. And, and I just remember like, well, what are we gonna do with this? Like, there's no impact beyond this room. And this language is going to be used on the same communities and the same audiences so that it can use it on the same communities and the same audiences. And it's not actually, I don't feel like it's actually doing the thing that I wanna do, which is make an impact on people's lives. So um, I pulled out of that PhD program, and this is at the, I guess, kind of towards the middle of 2008 around, and I ended up moving to Seattle, and I had no professional experience. I was, what, 29, and I had no professional experience other than I knew how to read, I knew how to write, I could persuade somebody to think about something in a certain way. Um, and there were no jobs. I was too overqualified for all the entry level jobs and I was underqualified for anything mid level. Um, but just also the economy was just, it was right at the, the real estate market crash and it just, there was nothing. So when I moved to Seattle from New York city, um, I basically was like, well, let's just follow the things that I love to do. If there's no jobs, I might as well volunteer somewhere. And so I um, used to volunteer at a therapeutic horseback riding uh, program at the barn that I used to ride at in New York. And, um, and what it is, is it's um, equine facilitated therapy for, usually the program in New York was for kids with disabilities. And this, and little bit was um, equine facilitated therapy for kids and adults with various disabilities and behavioral, um, intellectual disabilities, um, and uh, physical, physical disability. So I started volunteering as a, I like, I supported the rider, I, you know, made sure that it was a safe environment. And then there was an opportunity to, for a part-time development, it was in a development coordinator. So I was literally data entering um, donations and sending out thank you letters, which was always, which was kind of interesting. It was like, okay, this person gives us much. I want to understand what the appeal was, um, why they're giving, what's their history of giving. All of a sudden I started getting really into managing this database <laughs> and really, you know, like I said, I do everything full on. So I went full on and I understood the, all the nooks and crannies of this database and, and ultimately ended up within about a year and a half, I was co-director of the development department. So reframed how we were storytelling, the mechanisms through which we were telling these stories, how we were engaging riders and their families um, to really share the impact that this program was having on people's lives. And yeah, so that, that was my first job. It was great. I mean, I, it was like a dream come true in so many ways. That's awesome. That's awesome. And it's crazy that you moved from uh, New York to Seattle to <laughs> and that's awesome that it worked out and um i'm, I'm mm -hmm. glad that you gotta do that work and it is it is interesting to hear like why people are donating money to certain programs and because i'm guessing those those stories or those yeah. like whys vary differently by person to person and it could be it, it could be like something that's very touching i could just be someone trying to scare get rid of money or something like that yeah and and i think you know i think that everybody whoever i think what I've learned about donor relations and, and nonprofit work generally is that people want to give to a program because they want to make an impact. And maybe they're not the ones who are going to design the program or the product or go out and, and volunteer in Nairobi, or maybe they can't do that because of their lives or, or resources or, or whatever. Um, but they have some, some resources that they can give to that effort um and so it's an it's actually i've always seen donations as a way to invest in um in opportunity and invest in 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 in, in, in impact really mm -hmm. so 
I love that view. And I, and I think that that is a way that we should try to frame it more often. Like, you know, you're not just donating yeah. to, to help this program, but you're investing into it to create an impact in whatever cause mm-hmm. that, that you're looking to do. That, that's a yeah. great way to frame it. Okay, awesome. So you did that job for a bit, you got a promotion. Um, and then <laughs> after that job, you went and became a research consultant at Arizona State University. Mm-hmm. So how do you mm-hmm. come across that? And then what, what do you do there? <laughs> Oh, geez. Yeah. So, um, so while I was at Little Bit, I got pregnant. I had my daughter. And again, I was faced with a choice. And the choice was I could continue to work full time at this nonprofit and make less money that I, than I would be paying a full time babysitter, miss all these moments with my baby, and, and still be in the red. So that made no sense to me. So then what else could I do? to create a situation where I could be part of my baby's life and also work full time. So I went back to little bit and I said, look, I can write grants. I know how to manage that process. Let me do it remotely. I'll come in on the weekend to be, you know, part of the program, et cetera. And they said, okay, let's try it. And so I started working remotely in that capacity full time and, um, and then taking care of my daughter full time. I didn't sleep much, but it was great in terms of like, it definitely prepared me for this moment. I, I was like, I've been remote working forever. I'm <laughs> fine. Um, <laughs> this is great for me. So while I was remote working, I, I don't know where I met her, but I met this woman named Swati Surf, who is an entrepreneur in Seattle. And she had developed a mobile game called Light Sprite. And the goal of the game was to reduce anxiety and depression amongst women in particular. And it was literally like, you have a fox and you are trying to get fox to become a Zen master. So there's breathing exercises and, and um, being in nature and like bubble popping exer- like games. And, and, um, and so sh- I volunteered. I thought it was fascinating that we could use a mobile phone to impact health. And here I went full circle back into my health space. And I, so I started writing for her and helped her to um, define her value proposition and, and build decks and do all the things that you do for startups. Um, and in the process, I got introduced to the nascent health 2.0 world. Um, and she had won the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Games for Health Challenge. And we went down to the health 2.0 conference. I met you know, Unity Stokes before, um, before startup health was anything and, and, uh, and just was blown away. It was like this, like, what is happening in this space? This is amazing. So as I do, I go at it full force. And I was like, I know how to read and write. I'm going to be a journalist. And so I basically pretended it initially, and then I became a journalist. Um, And I started writing for anybody that would publish my stuff. So that was including like uh, an, a very early publication called Med Crunch, Med City, um, KQED, small publications. But basically what it allowed me to do was get on the phone with a whole bunch of CEOs and founders and, and builders and shakers and learn about the space. And so I was fascinated with this idea of wearable technology and, um, and continual monitoring. I got involved in the quantified self community um, and, uh, and, and citizen science. And, um, and so just kind of launched this exploration, enter ASU. Uh, I, early in my Seattle years, I had been connected with a woman who was working with ASU as a senior research assistant or uh, associate um, and she was consulting on projects and they had, it was ASU's Biodesign Institute and their Office of Sustainability. And so they were always looking for different projects that they could invest in and build um, that would improve people's health and wellness. And um, <clears throat> my friend Claire brought me in and said, hey, you've been working in this, this digital health space and, and wearable technology. Um, maybe there's a way that you could be a liaison between the consumer space and the public facing um, area, health area, and then and then what might and help us to kind of think about a program that we might build internally. And so we created 
uh, what was it called? Oh my gosh, it was um, Project, Project, I wanna say it was like Project Beehive, I'm totally blanking on the name. But anyway, it was, we created a, a essentially a, a program that was trying to think about the utility of consumer wearable devices as continual monitoring um, applications for clinical use. And so of course the, the means to do that was through clinical trials, um, which of course doesn't really work because clinical trials are years um, and consumer wearables like the Fitbit was, were changing over every six months. Mm -hmm. So data refinement, uh, what they were actually measuring was inconsistent. So anyway, long story short, it was, I kind of, that was my work there, was, was really helping to bridge the world of academia and the, the ideas that were kind of percolating there with what was happening in the industry and um, kind of com combine the two. Okay, then there's a lot in there. Uh, I don't think I'm going to recall <laughs> a lot of things like right now, but I, I think it's awesome to, to just hear that like you started off, you found this entrepreneur in Seattle who's working on this health related game, got involved yeah. with that. Then you're like, all right, I'm a, I'm a journalist. And then you start writing for, <laughs> for a bunch of different uh, blogs and different uh, journalist uh, platforms that allowed you to write. And then from that, like all this great stuff came came out of it, which is which is awesome. But I think it's like just believing in yourself and and really knowing that, okay, if I if I go full into this, something is gonna happen. And, and yeah, that. so that that's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> Maybe a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so while you were also a uh, research consultant, and I, and I'm guessing you're still a grants and data specialist at the time. You um I, I had stopped doing that at the time yeah okay okay yeah so you became a blog editor for dr kiyoshi kurokawa Kuru uh -huh. who is who, you can see it it sounded better from you kurokawa okay awesome he's the chairman of japan's health policy mm -hmm. uh so so tell me how, how you get involved in that and like how did that work out yeah Japan showed up interestingly in, at ASU because the director at the time, this this um, man named Michael Burt, he uh, was also he got his PhD in, in Japanese studies, totally disconnected, um, and and then ended up in in public health um, and in the aging aging science and um, aging in place kind of space, and so he was close with Kurokawa and. Um, and anyway, he needed some support in writing. And I said, I can help to do that. I took a lot of little contract jobs. And this is before I launched my, um, my agency. And we can, we'll talk about that, in, I guess, in a second. But, um, but really, I started to kind of bubble out and diversify who I was working with, um, the types of work I, I was, the types of projects I was working in. Um, you know, Kurokawa was interested, obviously, in policy, and he was also, it's, it was a curious thing to translate English written in by a Japanese professor into readable, digestible English. Um, so it was, you know, I think more of a fun project than anything really else. Yeah, that, that makes some sense. So, so you said you said uh, just now that you started an agency. So you're the founder and managing director at Agency Other. So, mm -hmm. what was the process for founding this? What was the thought process for doing it? And then, uh, what did you do in this agency? Yeah. So, I, um, with my work at ASU, I found that I was really good at being able to work with diverse voices and stakeholder groups and to really understand the challenges, but then also their goals and, and help them to really define how they're going to achieve those goals. Um, so working with lots of startups and listening to a lot of startups, especially in the wearable space, um, you know, it was just exploding. I mean, the health 2.0 digital health space was just, which is really exciting and fun. And I learned a ton during that time. And I also saw that there was an opportunity for 
somebody who had industry knowledge and kind of the macro picture was able to connect dots and be strategic about how to position each of these different, how to position um, companies in a way that would connect them with the right, their, their customers, um, tell good stories, et cetera. Um, and really treating startups like nonprofits. So I started applying a lot of those early um, learnings about how to tell an impactful story in the nonprofit space in, um, in, a, in applying it at the, in the startup space. And during the time too, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is an organization that I've, I've just always really respected and admired for how they invest in people and, and, and institutions and, and, and innovative kind of um, research initiatives, um, they were starting to really push the, the culture of health, um, building a culture of health, that, that tagline forward and then defining it in like really, really, I thought beautiful ways. And I felt like what I was trying to build with Agency Other was um, this kind of, I was trying to just like infuse infuse these companies with insight that would be impactful to their growth and their trajectory um, to success. Did it work with 99% of them? No, um, but, uh, but it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was great. It was a small agency. Um, and so we really started out, like I said, with uh, more marketing and, and pitching and positioning. Um, and then over time, I started leaning back into my anthropology and I started really leaning into the methodologies in questioning that I, that I learned and practiced uh, at school. And then I started doing what is now called applied anthropology um, in my agency to really help to def define unique strategies and, and stories and, and um, ways to impact for these companies. So, um, so I got to do some really great work in terms of, you know, uh, deep research, ethnographic, uh, qualitative research, and and um, that was those were some of my favorite moments. Okay, that that is awesome. Uh, firstly, yeah. what what is applied anthropology? Um, it, in my mind, it's 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 basically using the academic anthropological methodology. So like mixed method research, ethnography, um, th that idea of centering voices, it's really thinking about, and then, and, and then using it in the real world in real world settings and in order to excavate the wisdom and the, um, and, and the connections and the resources of a local community so that that, and, and this could be a company, it could be a team, it could be um, a family unit, but really so that it, you're, you're, facilit it's, 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 you're facilitating deeper knowledge through a line of questioning. Okay, and that, that makes sense. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And another question around like the agency, how, how, does one start an agency and get like clients and stuff like that? How did that work out for you? Ooh, um, well, I told you I pretended to be a writer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that was one way I would, I would show up at these conferences as a writer. I would talk to people. I would, and then I would kind of slide in. Oh, and I've got this agency, by the way, that can help you with that. And the other way was um, actually through Twitter, to be honest. Uh, and Twitter, I found to be a remarkable listening vehicle. So I, and I still go on and I will, it democratizes access to some of the best voices and thought leaders out there. And if you, again, learnings from nonprofit land, <clears throat> if you show up with some flattery and with a humbleness and a willingness to learn, most often people will wanna talk to you and they'll share and connect with you. And, um, and so that's how I met most of the, that's how I met Andre. That's how I met my current boss, Adam, who was a friend before he was a boss. Um, it's how I met, uh, you know, Stephen Downs from 
from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation or Susanna Fox from, you know, former CTO of HHS, um, who I would call a friend now. So a lot of folks that were um, crucial members of my network who would then refer me out to friends of their own or, or other people in their network were primarily from Twitter. Okay, yeah, that's awesome, and I'm glad to hear that Twitter is is has and is <laughs> still a resource that people use to to get to get a lot of uh, information and make connections. Because uh, as you said, like it, it is a is a crazy space, and I think I think of it like in, in the exact same way, like Twitter and like LinkedIn. <clears throat> you just have access to people that are doing amazing things at the at yeah. the like tip of your finger, you know, and, and that, that in itself is just amazing to think about and in the world that we are in right now. Like, yeah, like I, I met you through LinkedIn, like, <laughs> look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. And and I think there's, I mean, I, I think coming from the, it, perhaps, but like coming from the space that I did, I didn't ever, I never learned and then working in nonprofits and startups, like I never learned the order of hierarchy. Like there was no, you know, if you have a CEO title, it really doesn't mean much to me. If you have a CTO <laughs> of HHS title, I'm like, awesome, how'd you do it? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that, um, I mean, it's, it's really, it's the person, not the title that I'm interested in. So with every single person that I connected with on Twitter or LinkedIn, they have always been like, talking the right conversation, talking about how, what it means to care for people, to listen to people, to make positive impact on the world. And they're doing it in a way not to like build a brand, but in a way that's authentic and like, you know, soul to the earth, just care through care, just talking about care. And so I've been able to identify somehow like identify those people who I think are um who really do care and who really do care about um changing this space and and you know improving it yeah so okay that's awesome okay so you said that you got a lot of your agency clients through your writing through your journalism mm -hmm. that that you said mm -hmm. that you kind of faked at the beginning so yeah. you you worked as a journalist <laughs> or in the journalist space for a couple uh, places medcrunch health health 2.0 seattle light mm -hmm. sprite um like looking back now on on those experiences because it, it seemed like it was valuable in the sense that i got you in the room with these people that you can have conversations with that led to business yeah. and led to different relationships would you do that same thing if, if you had to repeat the life would would you do that again that's a great question um knowing what i know now mm -hmm. um no i don't i think that a lot of time was lost um or not lost but there was a lot of stuff that I didn't know um, because I was so inexperienced in terms of business. And so I kind of gave myself a business, business 101, you know, mini MBA at the same time as doing, as building a company that I had really no idea about how to build and, um, and doing my own business development, which I didn't understand how to close deals. I mean, so there was a lot of elements that I didn't even know, I didn't know that where I could have, I think I could have found people who would be mentors or um, better uh, navigators for me um, and help me to kind of identify the things or the, the, the skills that I really needed to think about business in a more, um, I don't know, operational way, more goal-oriented way. I mean, I'm an academic. I'm just like, it's all great. So, you know, <laughs> so I, I think that I, and I always felt, I mean, I, I'm sure you hear this. I always felt like an imposter. I'm like, you're going to believe who I am and what I do and what I think. Okay. Are you sure? Like it was always, I was always just like not believing. And I think, you know, even if I had somebody who's like, look, you know, like, 
reminding me that I am providing value rather than just kind of doing it. It would have been helpful. Okay, that, that makes sense. And it sounds like like opportunity cost, um, just just looking for like people that could help you streamline the learning and, and really development, yeah. which 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 makes a lot of sense. But um I guess we can't take it back. And uh, I'm glad that you took you took the steps to, to become a writer, <laughs> a journalist, and then do that type of work. Yeah. That, that, it was that, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well that 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 definitely does help as well. Yeah. Um, and does this agency are those still exist to this day or what has happened no i i closed it when i had my second kid okay. um so i closed it in 2018 okay okay fair enough fair enough mm -hmm. okay so after founding and managing the agency other you moved on to a project lead at innovation next accelerator actually before i ask you about this you said that a lot of the from the journalism and the things that you're doing you you got to learn more about like the health tech space do you think that was beneficial in in like because do you think you would have learned about that if you hadn't if you hadn't gone into this fake journalism life that you decided <laughs> to do <laughs> um no I don't I, I I think that I think that the nature of writing and I think journalism is in a way um especially I wasn't looking just to like report out. I was doing more um, more big thinking or deeper thinking pieces always because that's just how my brain works. Um, and so I don't think that I would have been able to really understand the landscape, um, really understand how the digital health space was exploding and which parts were exploding and be able to even see kind of the erosion that was already starting to happen and the and the and where you know different areas were combining and connecting and and where there was um kind of data and interoperability challenges and so i think that i was able to be because of that that journalistic work i was able to really to get a, a good lay of the land mm -hmm. and when i think a marketplace is being disrupted when a marketplace is you know, there's going to be lots and lots and lots of shiny, gadgety, noise-making things. And if you don't have a full a, a, a grasp of the lay of the land, then you could easily get lost in in these different directions, right? And um. And I think, yeah, like I I think that that was absolutely valuable. I don't know how else I would have gotten that, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. Okay. And that that makes a lot of sense. Like even though it wasn't something that like directly brought you value in that it allowed you to it gave you the time and the space to really learn about this this field that was being disrupted and continues to be disrupted to, to this day which which i think in itself is is valuable mm -hmm. okay. yeah okay so you're a project lead at the innovation next accelerator so tell me yes. before you tell me how you how you come across this and what you do what is the innovation next accelerator well it doesn't exist anymore but okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> so the innovation next accelerator was an initiative that was funded by the national institute to prevent teen pregnancy i might have butchered that but um it's a very long name and it was created to simulate innovation and creativity in and around the teen health and wellness um, pregnancy prevention space um, sexual education space um, <clears throat> and one of the projects that i did in for agency other was to redesign a website for the um, nevada health department that was targeting um teens and positive sexual you know trying to educate around positive sexual behavior and so they had what you typically see in a you know family health clinic website it was very you know browns and grays and you know drop down menus that are rickety and um and so we uh i brought on um my ex-husband actually and um and a consultant from Seattle who has designed a lot of the sex ed curricula um, 
for the public school systems in throughout King County. And we um, we redesigned the whole website. It's called True Health Needs Knowledge or Think Nevada. I think is is I think it's still up. But we everything is um, graphical and uh, very sex positive. It's all in very easy um, to understand language. Um, and and it's it's a it's a fabulous website. And so during the time, one of the and we did a lot of research and a lot of work to really understand what the pain points were for the teens um, in really trying to access this information that was going to help them navigate um, relationships and sex and all the things. And um, and one of the things that was kind of surprising was they said that. Uh, they wanted to really understand or learn about sex from their parents, which I was like, oh, of course, okay. And so then that was curious to me. So I went online and I was like, well, what kind of information is available for parents? Turns out there's really nothing. There's PDFs and there's books that you just kind of give to the, the child, but there's no way, there was no interactive dynamic um, application or website that would help parents really talk to their kids about sex and about their bodies in a way that was um, helpful. So anyway, all that to, to be said, there was at the same time, the uh, Innovation Next Accelerator announced this challenge. Um, so there was, uh, I wanna say it was 10 spots or nine spots. There were nine or 10 spots, $80,000 of funding. You come up with an idea. So I had already started a business plan with my Seattle collaborator and then a clinician who worked in a teen health clinic in Colorado. So I had combined these wealths of knowledge in these different spaces. And I was the kind of the business lead. And we applied for this grant and we got it. So we got eighty thousand dollars, and we and Idea was hosting hosting it. So I we every month for about a week of the month we would go up to San Francisco into the Idea um, uh, offices and learn about design thinking and ethnographic research and applied anthropology and all of the things, um, and start really pulling apart this concept that we entered the challenge with. Um, ultimately, ultimately ending up with a pitch and, you know, but yeah, that's what that was. It was, it was an amazing experience being part of an accelerator, um, you know, being put into this kind of weird collaborative comp competitive space with these other teams. Um, yeah. So that was, it was, it was a great experience. Yeah, so it sounds like a great experience and sounds like a, a culmination of a lot of different things coming together as well as yes. it's, it's awesome that you have like the partnerships as well as starting to build out like that business plan, which probably made it a, a little bit easier for you to do. A lot yeah. Of that work. Okay, that, yeah. That, that's awesome. And and then after this, you were advisor at Health XL. So mm -hmm. tell me a little yes. bit more about that. Yeah, so the Health XL organization is an interesting organization. What they were trying to do was, there were a lot of pilots happening at this, and during this is again, during kind of the height of digital health explosions. And there were a lot of pilots trying to validate consumer wearables or alternative means to um, expand access, lower costs. And so they started developing, this is with a, a man named John, Kelly, I believe is his name, is the founder. And you can correct me there if I'm wrong. Um, and then Carlos Rodarte was the one who actually got me, got me um, into the organization. But it was really um, trying to create uh, connections and bridges for innovation, but then also develop kind of a playbook for other organizations or other clinics to try it in-house, try these pilots in-house and and validate them. So it was trying to create kind of this, um, a warehouse for innovation, but then also more efficiencies and and um, uh, more effective partnerships, I think. Okay. And so I was part of, I was part of it in, in a way, but I don't think that I was necessarily really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> 
so so if let, let's say you were necessarily helpful what did you do as, <laughs> as like an advisor in, in this role? mainly introductions so it was connecting with my you know with my network or trying to think about who might be able to facilitate a network or, or some other connection that was going to be valuable to move a project forward or um, you know, even I could, there were also opportunities that they were trying to design into the pilot. So like, you know, oh, we need a clinician or, oh, we need somebody who's going to be a strategist or a communications person. So really like helping to outsource, I guess, um, needs for each of the different pilots that they were running or at least helping to run. Yeah. And, and a connector is someone that's always very valuable. And um, yeah, and that that's like a skill set that people don't talk about enough, I think, but it is it is a, a big one that that can make or break a lot of projects. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So after this role, you move hmm. on to become the director of communications and partnerships at Atlas of Care. And yes. So before I, I ask you about this role more. I wanted to ask, like, so right now you work as director of strategic communications at Bento, and we we'll talk about that after we speak about this role and the question that I have now. How how did you, how how do you like how did you cultivate that communication skill set and like learning that was it just from like the experiences that you had as being a writer and working with like nonprofits as startups or was it like startups as nonprofits or one of those two ways you said it I can't remember. Um, yeah, so tell me how do you cultivate that communication skill set? I'm going to answer it in two in two ways. I, I think the work that I did, again, going back to the journalism and then in my anthropology work and writing for um, trying to explain complex ideas in easily understandable um, language has kind of always been a, a uh, I don't know if it's a skill, but I think it's a talent that I have. I, I'm, I think that I am able to really synthesize a lot of information, connect disparate dots that people don't necessarily see, and pull out a story that helps people to really get at what I'm at, 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 the, at the story, the idea, the um, the impact, the value, whatever I'm trying to whatever I'm trying to get people to do. They usually they get that. And that happens to be communications. And, <laughs> and I would say that I, I, I continue to be very, very good at, um, at doing that, really identifying and telling a story about a company, about a value proposition, and building excitement and energy and connections and pitching it all, you know, in, in purpose of, in kind of like, in the purpose of that. The tactics that communications as a profession has at its disposal, social media, content calendars, uh, digital marketing, public relations in a, a, an interesting way, that part has all been learned and learned in the way that my journalism or my business lack of acumen has been learned. While I had my agency, a lot of the work that I ended up doing was in the marketing space and was in the, well, how do I leverage social media as channels to convey this impact? And how do I use these other me mediums, um, be it a pitch deck, be it uh, a conversation that that is going to lead to some sort of attainment of a goal, right? So I think for me, the communications part that I'm not really great at is the execution. I have relied on teams and interns and um, to really help me to execute and realize some of the vision and some of the strategy that I put forward. Yeah, and, and that's been a positive and negative thing. I mean, I, I think that uh, I hold myself accountable for the results that I get in these communication strategies and content plans that I, I put together. And I think I'm really hard on myself when I don't actually achieve what I'm trying to achieve. Um, I think other people think I'm trying, I'm doing a really good job. And the only reason I say that is because I get other jobs that are similar to the one that I had before. <laughs> um, but I think that I I have seen some really, really effective communications 
some executors and and operators and they are just badass um and i would not put myself in that category Fair but I, I can I can think about the strategy and I can I can I, I know for sure the direction we need to go to achieve the business goals. Okay, that's awesome. And I, and I think it is good to like highlight that you know where your weakness is, is in the execution and just being aware of that and having that awareness allows you to tap into, as you said, your team or the interns to really support you to, to make sure that you're doing that because you have the strategy part down, down pat, but it's just the the executing, but the awareness is, is very, very important there. Yeah. Okay. So going back to you. So you were director of communications and partnership at Atlas of Care. So yep. tell, tell me a little bit more about that. When I was pretending to be a journalist, <laughs> I was going to these quantified self meetings and learning about wearable devices and citizen science. One person that I connected with by hearing his presentation and was like, what is this? It was a, this amazing applied anthropology work in understanding care giving ecosystems and like networks. And I was just fascinated. And so of course I'm just like barreling through the crowds and like, hi, my name is Sue. And we became friends and he had this project, Atlas of Care that was funded initially by a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, um, Pioneer Portfolio Grant. And the idea was that there's all of this work being done to support family caregivers. And yet they're, they continue, the programs and the services are still not hitting the mark and, and, and there's still respite issues and, and there's still burnout and there's still health issues and, 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 and um, you know, paid, fam uh, paid caregivers aren't showing up or just all of these things. And so one of the things that was realized was there's just a lack of, of, of data that really explores what family caregivers truly need. And so the research initiative was, was aimed at that, was really like, how do we get a much more dynamic and um, multidimensional data set that can show us what caregivers experience? And so the research involved 14 different families with different caregiving needs. It was ethnographic, so it was daily journaling. We had a narrative clip, so it took pictures of people throughout uh, a week, I believe. There was uh, ethnographic research, so um, so uh, questioning and and going into the house and exploring and observing. There was um, sensor uh, house sensors that were put up. Um, what else? Wearable devices, and anyway, lots and lots of data um, about movement and temperature and heartbeat and you know memory. And what ultimately ended up coming out of this amazing data set was that everybody had a very different experience of caregiving and that um, there was never going to be a one bullet solution for what family caregivers experience. One of the, one of the, um, one of the tools that we use to help families or help the caregiver talk about their experience was this thing called a care map. And it, is essentially it's a paper pencil tool and it is literally like you draw a stick figure <laughs> this is me this is who i live with this is the person i care for this is my house my dog my pet whatever and then who you kind of put on the on the paper who else cares for that person be it a uh, online community a, a particular tree in a park um, a church group, uh, your doctors, family, friends, whatever. And the ways in which the care is signified is through lines, arrows showing direction of care, thickness, thinness showing frequency of care. And, and the stick figure, you know, very, you know, rudimentary houses, drawn trees, etc. This becomes this really interesting tool for storytelling. And what we and 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 for talking about your experience in a way that was holistic and 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 um kind of in a way that helps the individual to recognize the people and the network that they had around them in either a positive or a negative way so i don't have enough support here i don't have enough support so it showed those gaps in care 
but then also the abundance of care in some cases. And so I helped Rajiv, um, who is the founder of this nonprofit, I helped him initially with synthesizing all that research and creating these reports. Um, and so that was my entree into Atlas of Care. And then it came on as the director of communications and partnerships, kind of in the second phase where we got additional funding from AARP and the Santa Barbara Foundation to design education experiences for local community members to draw their own care map and then to share it with each other. A peer to peer learning experience happened, of course. Um, and just to kind of elevate this idea of care in the community. And so I was kind of in, and depending on funding and waves of that, I was very much part of that initiative from kind of, I don't even know, but from the start to the end. And I mean, it's still going in some cases, but, but uh, we did it in Michigan and uh, during COVID, it was a really interesting experience but it was all this like really interesting, going back to you know my fascination with community, healthy communities, unhealthy communities, cults, fascist nations. Um, <laughs> this really spoke to me because it was a way to, one way to ensure a healthy community because by visualizing and seeing yourself connected to other people within your locality, and seeing how those interdependencies and seeing sometimes perhaps the lack thereof, um, perhaps where you might want to invest more time and more resources, more care, um, you're seeing yourself not as this kind of isolated automaton. You're really part of and connected to the health and wellness of your family, but then also your neighborhood and, and that, that collective. And part of that too was reliant on your own health. So it was not only that they're seeing themselves in a community and themselves in a collective, but they're also seeing that it's absolutely important to be cared for by and demand the care by your family, by your community. Um, and when you can draw it and see it, you can ask for it. That's awesome. No, that, that's really fascinating work. And it's not, it's not something you'd think of uh, very often, but just like the simplicity <laughs> of it but it creates you know, like these elaborate stories and connections between people and places and communities and just it shows like a lot of the importance of a lot of the public health work and and why community and support is such a big factor in not only for for caregivers and people who are take being taken care of by caregivers but just people in general um so, so i appreciate you sharing that as well yeah yeah and you moved into the position that you're in right now as Director of Strategic Communications at Bento. Uh, go to gobento.com. So <laughs> what is Bento and then how do you come across this and what do you do? Yeah, so Bento, again, through my network and through uh, a conflation of network and timing, um, Andre was working with Adam Dole, who's the COO and co-founder of Bento. Um, to find a uh, director of marketing is what they wanted. And they really thought that they wanted somebody who was going to do digital marketing and, and advertising and, and build this whole kind of uh, almost like just build a, an aware, a, a brand awareness that was just otherworldly. <laughs> but, but after multiple conversations, and we can skip this, this is kind of like superfluous to everything else, but um, the, the, really the important part was that Andre um, and my friend Naveen Rao were working together on uh, thinking about people for this bento role. Uh, I had just spoken to Adam, I was in a very toxic um, work situation that's not on my LinkedIn. I was, I was the director of communications and development for this, for, a nonprofit that I won't name. Um, and it was just a really bad fit. And um, nothing like a really bad fit to uh, make you question any and all of it. It was, it was very bad. Anyway, so I was really feeling low. I had just spoken to Adam as a friend because I had known Adam through my network and Twitter probably. 
And he's again, like just one of those caring, heartfelt humans. And I was telling him about my experience. And then I was talking to just everything completed and was like, well, Susan does this. We should, we should connect. There should be an interview. Um, so what was fascinating to me about Bento and what Bento is, is so at its core, it's an SMS. So it's a text messaging platform that connects people who are experiencing food insecurity to nutritious meals at local restaurants and now grocery stores. And it launched out of, it, it, well, it was really born out of a think tank called the Not Impossible Labs. Um, and Adam had told me about Bento right before the pandemic hit. So I was at um, the Not Impossible Labs, which is um, essentially it, it designs technology for humanity. So it, it really believes and, and, and not even believes it, it functions as if nothing is Im impossible, as if, and it's kind of the ethos that I run my life by is just this like, there's humans, there's creativity, there's resources, there's this problem, it's surmountable, we can do this. And it's about getting the right teams and the right resources in, this, in the right room. And so I had been part of these brainstorming sessions for the Non-Impossible Labs a couple of times, um, one for like a memory app, um, and another one for a caregiving app. And, and Bento emerged out of this recognition that there were 50 million people in the United States who experienced food insecurity. And it's not because there's not enough food. We know how much food waste there is, but it's a lack of access to the food. And, um, and while there's amazing, amazing in organizations and institutions that, that are built to support that need, there's still people who are falling through the cracks and it's still not as accessible as it could be. And so Bento, um, Not Impossible Labs creates really every technology that it, it develops is frictionless. So that means that it's easily implementable across the entire spectrum of its users. So that means that for restaurants, it was, there was restaurants don't even know that they're part of a, a bento program. Um, participants, it's text messaging. So it's SMS, you don't have to download an app. It's, it's, it's um, leveraging a, an expectation, a, a behavior that people do every single day, multiple times a day. Um, and, um, and for organizations, I mean, it's, it's very simple for them to just be able to, you know, they, they know their people, they, we work with a lot of um, community-based organizations, so they know, you know, who's in need, um, you know, how to access those folks, and they have a trust already built with a lot of those people as well. So really seamless, frictionless workflow, et cetera. Um, so at the pandemic hits, and Bento was not ready to launch, but um, we launched it and it was like, you know, chicken wire and, and, and duct tape and calling in restaurants and gift cards. And it was just to see how they could create the workflow that was needed to feed folks who were in need um, and working with the boys and girls clubs and a lot of local nonprofits to kind of pilot some of these programs. Um, ultimately, we got a badass technology office, uh, chief technology officer, some badass engineers, um, and a lot of this stuff has been automated. We have our own platform, and um, I was brought on to to really connect the dots again, to strategize and to communicate the impact that Bento is having in the healthcare space. So, I came on. We were still really looking at nonprofits and community colleges. Um, and having some great impact and, and, and a great uh, show of value in that space. Um, way easier to access those opportunities than it is in healthcare. And so we are doing a very deliberate pivot or not pivot, but a very deliberate shift right now towards proving our or operationalizing our value proposition in the healthcare space. And so because of my background in the healthcare space, I was able to, and I am currently, doing everything from partnerships, grant writing, storytelling, I'm redoing the website so that it's more aligned with um, really speaking to health plans and health systems that might want to use our product. 
and and you know the premise again going back to this idea of centering voices <clears throat> the whole product the thing that that got me about this product and I, it's the first product in since I've been in the space that I've wanted to commit to I've never wanted to commit fully to one single product and that's why I had my agency and why I've bounced around a lot but this product in particular um, like I mentioned, I grew up on food stamps, I grew up in the welfare system. So I know that shame and that embarrassment that so many families experience when they have to go stand in line at a food bank or have to apply for SNAP and prove how needy they are or, um, or you know, stand in line at grocery stores. We, I mean, it, I grew up during the time when you have like the actual stamps and so you had to like, and, and so there was always the, ca the cashier who was like, you know, calling her manager and was like, I don't know how to process these. And they'd have to like unring all the things and then re-ring everybody, everything. And, and the whole line is pissed off at you because you've got to use this. Anyway, um, the idea of Bento is that you preserve people's dignity. People, everybody is seen as equally valuable. You preserve dignity. You're not being asked to prove anything, to download anything, to do anything more than just go and pick up your meal for yourself and your family. And so you can focus on other things and that's it. It's like, just let's get that out of the way. Let's just address that because it's low hanging fruit, excuse the pun. And then let's help to connect you with other resources that might just move you towards a path of health, wellness, wealth, whatever that is, right? So, and, and, and it really is about this idea of like, it's, our care, like our, our programs, our care coordinators that we, you know, that we've, we've built this, this side of the, of the company and, and the amount of like respect and support that we provide each and every participant is just, it's, it's like, it, it, again, it's, it's, it's anthropological, it's deep listening and it's, and it's based on this idea, because I think really the Not Impossible Labs, the DNA is infused in bento, which is like, why can't we make sure that everybody gets their needs met? And why can't we have wraparound services? And why can't, like, again, we have the technology, we have the resources, we have the humans, let's do it. Like, nobody, nobody's needs are too great at this point. It's just like, stop. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that truly is awesome. And it, it's, it's really cool that it's like such a simple platform. Like you said, it's not even an app. It's just like you text people and they they bring you food. And you said that they also connected to other resources. Yeah, yeah. So we've done some really great pilots with like two on one LA okay. um, with, uh, you know, vaccine access. Um, we're working with a small clinic out in Memphis, Tennessee for HIV AIDS. And so we connect them with, you know, uh, food nutrition education and and get them back in the clinic for assessments and medication adherence and things like that so but it's all based on this idea that like you know if you are at risk if you you know historically marginalized and and experiencing food insecurity or experiencing really like low low income you're probably experiencing food insecurity so it's like just even if you're not like getting a warm meal sometimes for free is just a good thing. It's just a nice thing. You can spend it with your family and connect with your, your people. So yeah, it's the food is the similar to kind of like the housing first strategies where it's let's, let's kind of triage this, stabilize folks and, and get them to the next level. So it's food first in our situation. It's the, the point of the arrow, it's the entry point. And then there's ongoing engagement people are motivated to make sure that they are updating their information with us. They're motivated to connect with us to say, hey, you know, I'm gonna be, the nice thing too is like, it's like, hey, I'm gonna be working four jobs today and I've got a 20 minute break in this zip code. Are there restaurants around for me? And yes, we'll make sure that that's there so they can order at that time to make sure that they are fed at that time in between all their things. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just, it's. I hate to use this term meeting people where they are, but it really is. It's it's like there's no there's no reason we can't. Yeah. And we shouldn't. 
Yeah, and, and it's meeting people where they are in like a on a way that is, takes away a lot of stigma because they're already thinking about all these other things. Now they have to think about this other issue or people are going to look, look at me the same way because I'm using this or I'm using that. And that really does take them away, take, take, takes that away from it, which just allows people to eat, which I think is a, a basic need that many of us don't have or don't have the luxury yeah. to have. So, so I, I definitely see the utility. Is is it in uh, all states around, around the U.S.? It's in um, 11, 10, it's in 10 states. Okay. Um, we've got you, about 30 you, different pilots, yeah. Okay, I was going to say, you do not have to name 10 states. People can go to the website and figure that out. <laughs> yeah, it's in 10 states. It's, it's, we've got 30 different pilots in various types of um, contexts. Um, I think the biggest thing for me, again, kind of connecting the dots, you know, especially with my last role at Atlas of Care, where I was looking at networks and communities. Think of what happens to the mom who leaves a restaurant without being asked to show identification or give a CBT card or, you know, announce total anonymity, pick up food for her and then her family goes home, has dinner, doesn't have to cook anything, just like, but they can spend some time together. And it's, they have choice, they have connectivity, they have healthy food. There's something that happens to that, the, that sense of self-efficacy, the sense of um, confidence, um, one's own sense of self-worth, you know? Um, and I think that ha- that's a halo effect that happens from the mom to the kids to the you know the partner, and and I think it's so critical to and that's like the singular unit that's needed. Like I mentioned with the communities, if, if that individual, and uh, Vivek Murthy does an amazing job pointing this out in his book Together, where it's like if the single individual doesn't feel any sense of self worth, um, then they won't push up against the institutions and the structures that exist in a community or in a society or in a country that are meant that and 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 demand better and demand you know better support better care right because they're not going to think that they're worth it but yeah yeah so it it really does start with that like that sense of self-worth and and it's just so critical to protect and to ensure stays in, it stays intact. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because as, as we know, society has been telling people that they, they don't deserve this. They, they shouldn't get that. And just giving, yeah. them, giving them access to that. And then like another thing that came up as you were speaking there was the fact that they are getting this meal that's already cooked, that's warm. So that that's like time saving for themselves as well. Because that's, that's probably another thing thing that creates stress in their lives and just gives them a little bit more time to whether that's create deeper relationships with their children or work on something that's going to help them um, excel and reach to another another rung of social mobility in their life I I think that that's awesome so this is this is very interesting stuff and I'll definitely like tell anyone who's interested to reach out to you or just go to gobento.com to to learn more about this because this is fascinating Great. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. Uh, mm-hmm. So before I move you on to the last section of the show, the five questions mm-hmm. asked all guests, I would like to ask oh, yes. you, where would you like to see yourself in the future? Ooh. Um, actually, this one made me take a walk. I was like, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, well, I think that I will have some connection to the Bento team. Um, you know, we're a startup, so startups are always precarious. If we can make it, it's going to be amazing. And and if we can't, then we've had a hell of a good time getting to know each other. And so I'll always be connected to this team um, and kind of, and, and really aligned in, in, in passion and purpose there. Um, I really, you know, this is the first time I'm saying this out loud. I really hope to write a book. Um, in the next two or three years, I really believe that this idea of individual, I've had this kind of lifelong obsession for better or worse uh, about like individuality and community and 
Um, and so there's, I feel like there's something there and I don't know what it is, but I think I'll write a book. Um, and definitely teaching. I, I, I always go back to this teaching thing. And, and so I will in some way find myself at a college teaching something. I'm sure of it. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's awesome and uh look we look we look forward to the book so uh, just keep keep us posted and uh, if, you, if you need any help just let me know okay <laughs> I, i'll keep that in mind <laughs> <laughs> okay so moving on to the last section of the show the furious five um number one what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health listen listen to the people um and also pay attention to where the money flows. <laughs> I think I think you really do need to always be asking who's going to pay for that. You know, I think we are um, we go into public health or into public service with you know big Ideas. pink colored glasses and idealism. And I think keep that and keep listening and keep your boots on the ground. And also always ask who pays for it. <laughs> That's good advice. Um, number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Oof. Um, I think, I think keep following a line of, follow your line of questioning, follow your curiosities, have faith that you can really do anything that you set yourself to do. Um, and yeah, I think I think I would just say keep saying yes and 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 be curious, because I don't think that I would have thought that I was going to be here. I mean, we just walked through my whole career, and I don't think that any of it really would have been the oh yeah, of course you went to this next role. Um, but I think that I've always just kind of yeah, just followed a curiosity and and let that guide me. Makes sense. I like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Mm, sitting still and aggressive self-care. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, so with the, um, with the pandemic and it's, I, I, I recently I have had my first like really intense health situation and I've got an autoimmune situation, autoimmune thing, they've called it undifferentiated connective tissue disease. Um, and uh, so I'm on all these drugs and steroids and, um, and my autoimmune, my, my immune system is causing my connective tissue to be inflamed and really painful. And so, yeah, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm used to running about and running and rock climbing and horseback riding and and I can't do that now. So I'm, I'm figuring out how to just be still. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And I, I hope yeah. that uh, you are able to feel better. So your autoimmune disease like chills out a lot more. Um, <laughs> Same. <laughs> my, I'm putting my body in a timeout currently. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Mm. Um, two things. I would recommend um, the book, The Blue Sweater by Jacqueline Novogratz. Um, it's, she's the founder of the Acumen Fund, which is a, a slow capital social investment, social entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial um, uh, fund that <clears throat> is very creative in terms of its its infrastructure where it invests in people in a community that understand the locals and the, and, and the needs and the health and the wealth and all of that of a locality um, and are innovating to improve upon that. And so she invests in that individual, the social entrepreneur um, and connects the dots between the the technical skills that that entrepreneur might need, you know, more education around business or finances or whatever, and then also connects them with industry. So deeper, bigger pockets to really catalyze and, and, and scale that idea. That's awesome. Oh, and Twitter. I would say Twitter. 
<laughs> so that's also a great resource. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and then last but not least, where can people connect with you? Uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, my Twitter handle is Sue Schaffler, and I'm sure you'll add this in the comments. And then my LinkedIn. It's your name. Yeah. <laughs> You are up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and I'll be, I'll be sure to add both of those in the uh, descriptions as well as the show notes for people uh, that want to check that out. Amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking time to come come on today and, and share about your story. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot, and uh, I'm glad that, that I, I, I we had time to to talk today. Oh my gosh, me too. I I'm sure you must be exhausted. I can't believe you just did two of these back to back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, am, I am tired, but I'm I'm glad to to know that I have two of these episodes <laughs> down now. You know, so it's it's a relief so you, just, you just edit and and that's I actually have someone who edit, edits edits it for me. So thankfully, it's oh, just pass, passing awesome. it on to them. So like I'm wow. I'm glad about You're this. Golden. Early, but nice. I'm tr trying to be trying to be housekeeping items anyway. everyone um thank you all for listening to this or watching this greatly appreciate it if you have not subscribed as yet definitely be sure to subscribe if you have not left a five-star review i don't know what you're waiting on but leave a five-star review we greatly <laughs> appreciate it leave a like if you're watching this on youtube and share it with a friend um it might help someone navigate their public health journey just a little bit better so definitely do that and you'd like to support you can go to the phmillennial.com forward slash support and find all the different ways to support there <laughs>